Welcome to The Mary Mavis Show. The show that focuses on remarkable results and your personal power. Here is your host, Mary Mavis. So welcome. Uh, Season two of this show is focused on what you can do to thrive in your organization. And today we are talking about how to win in the performance management game. And I have two experts in the house, one a top consultant and the other a human resources executive. Let me introduce them to you. First, Mark Efron is the founder and president of Talent of the Talent Strategy Group, a global consulting firm that helps the world's largest and most successful companies improve the quality and depth of their talent. Mark co-authored the Harvard Business Review publishing best-selling book, One Page Talent Management, often called the Talent Management Bible. Prior to forming the Talent Strategy Group, Mark served as VP Talent Management for Avon Products and led the global leadership consulting practice for Aon Hewitt. He was also SVP Leadership Development for Bank of America. One of Mark's many areas of expertise is performance management, and today he will be sharing the way he thinks and advises his clients as they design their organization systems. Most recently, I was struck by an article he wrote called Why Meets Expectations Never Does. Welcome, Mark. I'm really glad you could be with us today. Thank you, Miriam. Looking forward to the conversation. My other guest is Erica Kaufman. Erica is the Vice President of Human Resources for Day and Zimmerman's Munitions and Government Business. At Day and Zimmerman, she has also held senior leadership roles in talent and organization development. Prior to Day and Zimmerman, she worked for Exelon as a management development specialist. She is a talent organization and leadership development expert. In addition, Erica is on the executive committee of the board of the Philadelphia Society for Strategy and People, a top strategic HR association. Erica is one of the most forward-thinking HR executives I know, always attracted to an organization's need to reimagine the way they do things. I am excited today to hear her thoughtful guidance around winning the performance game. Welcome to the show, Erica. Thank you. Okay, let's get started. So what we're going to start is why do organizations design performance management systems anyway? What is the purpose for an organization? I'm going to start with you, Mark, because you've worked with um, probably scores of uh, organizations to design their program. What are the common range of purposes for performance management? Well, Mary, I love the question primarily because most organizations don't ask themselves that question before they design performance management. Too often, companies think that performance management is simply something they should have, uh, as opposed to saying, this is a tool to solve a problem. What's the problem that we're trying to solve with it? So if performance management is designed well, it can do a lot of things. It cannot do everything, but it can do a lot of things. It can help to ensure that goals are effectively cascaded through the organization. It can help to ensure that uh, we are elevating individual performance. Uh, The components of performance management, whether it's goal setting or coaching, lots of great science behind those to say, if we do it, people's performance increases. We can organize it or companies can organize it around development. There are a lot of organizations that are shifting to say, we want this to be more forward-looking and about development. Uh, Sometimes it's purely a compensation vehicle? How do we uh, design performance management so that it flows in a seamless fashion into how we pay people? So there are lots of different things we can do with performance management. We find the key is let's decide in advance what the purpose is, because how you design it, the levers you push, you pull uh, are going to be very different depending on the outcome you want. Erica, how does that sound to you? Does, what does that strike you in terms of your real world? And Mark has obviously real world in the organization experience as well. But what strikes you about what Mark has said? Well, um, you know, I'd like to just emphasize a couple of the things he alluded to. I think 
fundamentally, and I've heard that good performance management is really just good management. So this is a tool to help managers have better conversations with their people. I mean, fundamentally, people want feedback on how they're doing. This helps channel the types of feedback that managers can provide. And I think it's also a really important tool for translating business strategy into individual action. So Mark mentioned cascading goals. It begins with the strategy, which can seem very big and lofty. Um, and then getting that really specific for each individual helps everyone see how they fit in. Yeah, yeah that's, that's actually one of the most valuable parts if you're really driving your performance, your own participation is that you understand how, what contribution you're making. But sometimes an organization doesn't have that at the heart that people really understand how they make a contribution. Right. And then it becomes a tool for increasing engagement. People are more willing to go above and beyond if they feel like the things that they're doing are meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. So what are the, you mentioned the components, Mark. So what are the components to most, the most typical performance management program? Yeah, um, building on what Erica said, in many ways, performance management is just good management. Do I know what I'm doing? Okay, so there should be a goal-setting process that says we want to make sure that you're working on the right things. Ideally, there are big things that interest you that that others care about you doing well, um, and that stretch you. And this is a component we oftentimes don't focus on enough in performance management. In the goal-setting process, are your goals actually stretching you? Um, is it going to be challenging to exceed those goals uh, and challenging to meet them? Uh, too often, goals are set to be met. Um, you do not get higher performance when you set goals you can easily meet. So step one, just a goal-setting process. Do you know the few most important things you're supposed to be working on this year? As simple as that sounds, my clients are all big, sophisticated companies. That does not happen with regularity in a a lot of organizations around the globe. So we start there. Are you clear about the few things you need to work on? And then just classic coaching and feedback. And I use those terms interchangeably. Some people uh, are more fussy about each of those. Are you getting insights throughout the year on how you can elevate your performance and your behaviors? Mm -hmm. Just as simple as that. Maybe it's four times a year, maybe it's 12 times a year. Uh, I'm agnostic as to how, to how often you and your leader have that conversation. It should be often enough to allow you to course correct um, and still be able to, uh, to deliver in the time that you have available. Uh, again, this is something that sometimes we in HR make needlessly complex. At the end of the day, let's say Erica's my manager, all that really needs to happen is Eric and I need to meet on a regular basis. She needs to be able to say, Mark, a few observations on goal one, I think maybe a little bit more to the left on goal two, keep going. It's working well. And here's an additional suggestion for something that can help you be even more effective. Does not need to be in a more complex conversation than that, but sometimes we like to uh, unfortunately set the bar at the 99th percentile of coaching quality uh, and weigh managers down with complex processes, or here's a 45-page guide. Um, I would love to see more people simply say, the expectation is, just what I've described, we're going to measure whether you do that, we're going to train you to make sure you're good at it, but just do that. Four times a year, six times a year, uh, I guarantee you there's a lift in performance for the organization. So goal setting, some sort of regular conversations during the year to help you keep your behaviors and your performance high. And then if you've set goals and you've coached against goals, theoretically, we should want to understand, did you achieve those goals or not? So some sort of review process to say, given what you told us you would do during the year, Mark, did you overachieve, achieve, or not quite achieve those goals. And ideally that should be a conversation that is pretty darned boring given the rest of the conversations we've had up to that right. point. Uh, and it should be, Hey, we've already talked about this, this, and this. When I summarize the year, it feels like this, maybe it's a rating, maybe it's not a rating, but it's just a way of tying up the year or whatever that performance period is uh, with a bow. And why do organizations use um, a numbered rating system versus just describing the um the performance or or having some descriptors for it uh, i look at that as a crutch 
not necessarily an unneeded crutch, but a crutch in that most managers are not particularly good um, at differentiating. The science would suggest most managers think their teams are just a little bit better than everybody else's teams, which is why in almost every performance management system, you see there is a very positive skew, a skew to work towards the higher performing categories. And having ratings is simply one way of forcing managers to say, there are a few different ways we think people can show up. And the science is clear. The number of ratings does not matter. So everyone has their favorite, does not matter. But in our company, we're going to slice performance into three categories or four categories or five categories. It gives managers a bit of a handle to use to navigate that conversation. So mm -hmm. in an ideal world, managers are brilliant at differentiating and having honest, transparent conversations. Uh, there's a lot of human psychology that says we're probably not going to do that as well as we should. So ratings are simply a way of structuring that conversation. Well, and if I could jump in, you know, I think that the ratings can be a way to ensure fairness because it does help us to calibrate and make sure that there's consistency. You know, some managers might be higher graders than others. And so with a little bit of oversight, we can smooth that out. And I'll say I've, I've seen a struggle with, and, and not just my current company, but in other places too, that the scale can be challenging. And I've seen lots of different types of scales. Right now, we're using a one to 150 scale, and that's because <laughs> goals are paid out based on the proportion of success. And so if you really blow it out of the park and you exceed 150% of what you were going to, what you said, your payment, your reward, your bonus is calculated with a formula that pays out at 150%. Um, however, for the Overall rating, we're changing that from a number to a descriptor. And the intent there is when the manager wraps up the conversation with a bow at the end of the year, what is that key takeaway? And a number is more evaluative than a descriptor that might help you really focus in on how you did and what you need to carry into the next year. Yeah. I think one of the most um Un, um, unclear parts of how organizations structure performance management and then tie it into compensation is that the same. So I think that's phenomenal um, in concept of separating out your compensation rating from your performance because if it, everything rests on the goals, right? So if the goals are calibrated and everyone has sort of similar stretch types of goals, then it shouldn't be a problem. But the reality is that when you're trying to distribute compensation uh, uh, with the same rating scale, you end up having somebody who absolutely met the goals. They should be... They, they actually absolutely exceeded their goals, but um, but they didn't exceed them as much as someone else. So it, it, it ends up being this distribution of compensation and it gets really confusing uh, for people to understand, well, wait a minute, you're telling me that last year I was a five and now I'm a four and I don't see any difference in my performance and explain it to me. So um, um, I think that that's an element of the way that organizations structure those rating systems that is at the very best confusing to people who are trying to receive the message, unless you're a five out of five, <laughs> and then it's a good thing. Yeah, I would say, Mary, part of that goes to companies and needing to be more clear about their talent philosophy. And in this case, it's relative versus absolute. You give them an absolute right. talent philosophy saying, if you make it over the bar, you win. Great. Uh, you can have a relative talent philosophy saying, there's always a top 10%. There's always a bottom 10%. Doesn't mean the bottom percent perform poorly, but 90% perform better than you, therefore. Too many organizations aren't clear about that. And so you have managers saying, all of my team was great. And you have 
uh, top leadership saying, great, which one was the absolute best and which one was the next best? And that's very frustrating because uh, they're playing by two very different sets of rules. So sometimes it's simply a matter of the company saying our point of view, the way we manage talent is either absolute or it's relative so that everyone is clear about what the rules of the game are. Yeah. And so, so we're going to talk about how do people get clear about what the rules are, you know, um, or at least how the system is structured. Um, but before we do that, is it changing? Is the, is, is performance, I don't mean changing the rating scales, (laughs) um, but is performance management evolving? Um, um, as we come into this new stage of organizational life? I hope so. (laughs) Uh, And we just are going through an implementation of a new system. So with that, our goal is to be more efficient, get more from the process. We did an analysis that looked at how much time is invested in doing this. You know, Mm -hmm. think about all the people involved in setting goals, approving goals, um, giving feedback, writing appraisals, how many times those documents get touched. And it, it was, it's very expensive, um, but it wasn't viewed as a cost to be taken out of the business. It was reconciled as an investment in our people. So we need to keep getting better. And I think it goes back to, to the goal setting as, as Mark described it's, and it's making sure that it's focused on the right things and that those goals are focused on results that are important to the business so that it's, it's a mechanism for improving individual performance while also improving the business's performance. Yeah. And so if you spend, if you spent more time calibrating and focusing on the goals in the beginning and then having the conversations uh, you know, when they make, when they make a difference, whether it's quarterly as a review, but you know, that people getting feedback when it makes a difference, uh, then the conversation about how somebody did is a no brainer. Correct. You know, and I also see some evolution in, um, getting more voices in the process. So mm-hmm. if you think about our performance management system, our process has been set up according to the hierarchy or the mm-hmm. org structure as it exists on paper. Whereas a lot of the work that people are doing are in teams and yet it, the system mm-hmm. wasn't flexible enough for a project yes. manager to be able to provide some kind of evaluation or a peer. So being able to introduce that element Um, and then also the, the pace of things are changing so fast. And it used to be that the goals got set at the beginning of the year. And then 12 months later, we look at how we did a lot of times the goals aren't even relevant 12 months later. And so we need to be able to evolve them if things change. That's wonderful because that was always a, well, you can't change the game. If you think of performance management as a game, you can't change the game midway through the year, except reality changed. (laughs) So it makes no sense. The context changed around us. Yeah. And to your point, you know, Erica, just today, I got an email from a client asking me for feedback for one of the people I've been working, not uh, who he and I have been co-managing a program that I'm running for the organization. And we've spent a lot of time doing that. And his manager asked me for feedback on him. I was like, whoa, <laughs> I'd be delighted to, you know, because this is a, an amazing person. Um, so, you know, that's an example of looking for where is the feedback uh, for, uh, for the person that would be helpful. Yes. So let's talk about, you know, the, you talked about having performance management more fair. And I just want to finish this part of the conversation today. Is performance management intended to be fair? Uh, Because it, it doesn't always feel like that. You know, I uh, remember for myself uh, working at a consulting firm that, um, and we, we did a stellar job of assessing people. You got a performance review for every project. You got feedback from the project manager. We talked about feedback every 
client assignment, you know, it was, we, we, and, and so I usually thought I know how I, how I did. And, and yet at the six month marker, um, uh, because we paid out bonuses at six months, um, I was often sort of like, well, wait a minute. I thought I was sort of a meet because we were very clear. Like sometimes you can't even, you don't even have the opportunity to be an exceeds and I would get an exceeds. And sometimes, so, you know, it's, it doesn't always match the person's experience. And, and what I hear from my clients is particularly the young ones. It doesn't feel fair. It, they didn't feel recognized. They didn't feel their performance was fairly assessed. I was going to say, Mary, that sounded like a loaded question. It is a loaded (laughs) question. I think that it's absolutely intended to promote fairness. Now, sometimes we're not always effective and that's why it's not always, um, it doesn't always seem that way, but it's a process that I think is by design to promote consistency in how we treat people. Now that's not to mean that we treat everybody the same, um, but to have a standard way of evaluating people is I think one of the intents. I don't know, Mark, has that been your experience? Uh, Yeah. I I like that direction. I would almost separate two concepts that might be blended together, objective and fair. I think people say, Oh, it's not objective. Therefore it's not fair. Well, unless you're selling widgets, even if you're selling widgets, it's really difficult to be objective because maybe the three of us have a goal. We each need to sell 25 widgets a week. Um, I might complain that I only sold 24, but I had a crummy region. Um, Therefore, so you're never going to get to perfect objectivity. But fair ideally uh, means that there is a standard that we're evaluating you against that you Mm -hmm. knew about at the beginning of the year goals. Um, You've had some sort of feedback or direction during the year. So if you were not performing at the level we wanted to, you heard about it, coaching. Um, And I'm being reviewed by somebody who I think has my best interests at heart and who is looking at those standards and the data. That's a fair system. I might not like the outcome because it's never going to be perfectly objective, but we also need to recognize that it's a performance review. It's not a performance debate. Uh, It's not a performance trial. Um, This is about your manager saying, I'm going to gather the best information I can about your behaviors, about your performance, and I'm going to make a judgment call um, given that and everything else I know about whatever the designation we give you, whether it's pay or rating, that also though feeds into, um, when we talked a little bit earlier about the, the ratings don't matter, they only don't matter in that if we can maybe have fewer, bigger ratings, we worry less about what category you've slotted me into. Right. Um, for a lot of our clients, even though I reinforce that the number of ratings does not matter, I really push them to a three-point scale with a really big middle portion that's labeled something like right. great year. Because that's what most people did. They had a great year. They showed up. They worked hard. They behaved well. They had a great year. If they didn't, they shouldn't be be there, right? Yeah, and if, <laughs> if they didn't, maybe, you know, there's 10% in the upper category. There's 10% in the lower category. But what we don't do is fight over what one of my bosses labeled the finer points of already fine people. Uh, and if fine. you need to send fine tuning messages, then, you know, Erica gets 107% of her bonus markets, 98%. We both had a great year, but we want to send you know, a little bit different message where both employees and managers, I think, find the most angst is when we try to slice people into categories where the dividing lines are really fuzzy. I think that's where fair starts to look right. very unfair because then it is pretty subjective. What's the difference between being rated a three and a four? I don't know. Uh, and that manager probably doesn't either. They probably have some uh, some forced guidelines from HR uh, that right. are putting, having them put people in those categories. Yeah. And so the communication isn't um, doesn't facilitate somebody feeling like their performance was really objectively assessed. Although one thing to add in, maybe not although, one thing to add in is <laughs> if I'm an employee, 
uh, as counterintuitive as this may sound, I should want the biggest, toughest goals I can get. Yeah. Because in most organizations, fair is also going to be relative to others. So Mark had a great year, but maybe Mary had a brilliant year. And therefore, we're going to tier the rewards that way. If I know I'm working on the biggest, juiciest, most challenging goals out there, I'm going to stand a much better chance at the end of the year being in that upper 10 or 20 percent of people where you say not only were the goals big, but they performed well against them. So if you think that your goals are pretty easy, I can meet those. You're probably not setting yourself up to to be in whatever that highest category of performance is. That is a great statement to set up uh, the conversation about what people can do if they're driving their own performance management uh, participation. Okay, so let's talk about goal setting and what any employee can do to own their participation in performance management. Erica, why don't you start? What would you recommend to an employee at Day and Zimmerman? Well, starting with goal setting, I think it's important that they understand the priorities of their business group or their department. So at a macro level, what is it that, back to Mark's point on the most important things and how do they plug in? So with that higher level understanding, it's setting just a few goals. It's not necessarily the day job, job description kinds of things. It's what's going to um, help prepare your team to be better or your group to be better. And a real practical tip I offer people is when you're setting your goal, three small words can make such a difference. So whatever your goal is, end it with, in order to, and that ensures that there's some kind of impact or result that you're working toward. And it's clear because if your goal seems nebulous, it's going to be really hard to know if you're on track, it's going to be really hard to describe the impact or progress that you've made. So you're almost writing your appraisal as you're setting your goal. If you can't imagine what you're going to say about how wonderful you did that year, on the onset, you're going to struggle at the end of the year. So those would be just a few of the things, but, and then once you've set your goals, I'd share them, you know, we're, we're a team and there's probably lots of people who um, can impact your success or failure. You've got to work with others, but maybe others have similar goals. And so to the extent in which you can share them, I think it shows everyone will be successful, but don't take your job description or the major work that you need to do and just stop there in terms of your goals. It's so like, if I do a great job, what's the impact of that on the business or on my function or on my team? What are the results? Uh, And bake them into um, uh, the goal that you set. And you know what I was thinking? You said, share them, Um, pressure test them. Yeah. You know, how amazing would it be if you went to some of the key leaders and said, here's what I'm thinking of doing this year. Why would that make a difference to you? How does that drive results in the business or how would that drive efficiency in, in the business? So it, I, I, you know, what am I going to do this year? That's going to really matter is a really good question. And then it, and then it doesn't become, how do I fill out the form in online? Right. How can I take the cascading, you know, my managers, my manager gave me her goals and now I can cask, I can take like two or three of them and then I'll just tweak a little bit and, um, and make sure that um, I'm in, in, rather than saying like, what's the possibility of what I could create this year. And I've seen appraisals at the end of the year where there's paragraphs and paragraphs of activity. And sometimes we mistake activity for results. And I think, wow, that person was probably really busy, but what impact did they have? And so that's most important to the business. Um, So, yeah. And I think that you're so that um, I always use the word, so what, so, so if you did that, so what, but you exactly. can, but you can literally put it into the goal so that this happens or so that my contribution makes this better. Um, exactly. 
And um, that's a real driver for most people in terms of feeling good about what they're doing. It can be challenging, I find sometimes, even for executives, we do a lot of work with executives and goal setting to be able to answer that question, though. Yes. Um, the And we always try to, to turn the conversation less around goals and what are the few big deliverables you are promising to the organization? Sometimes we even kind of use the promise word. What are the three promises you're making for what you're going to give to the organization this year? And and that sometimes flips the script to be able to say, uh, I'm going to give you a deeper and higher quality team uh, below me. I'm going to give you sales at 105% of uh, goals, and I'm going to get that project done by June 1st. It might sound like a cute word trick, but we all set goals and we try to achieve our goals. But Right. How many times do you make a promise to somebody and not right. try really, really hard to fulfill right. that promise? Right. I'm far more concerned about what promises do you want to make about what you're going to deliver to the organization than to Eric's point, the 85 things you're going to be busy with this year. We know you're going <laughs> right. to be busy. That's where we're giving you a big paycheck because you're going to be busy. Um, but you're busy uh, for the exact uh, words or uh, with the exact question that you mentioned, Erica, in order to do what? And and at, at the assessment time, that's where somebody could say, but I did all these things. Yeah. And they say, but they didn't have the impact that you could have. You didn't focus in on the things that could have your biggest impact. And I love, Mark, that you said, make them as stretch as you can. I had a client um, that had their system, and this is what, one of my concepts of winning at the game. I mean, they had it, it was a financial services company. So everybody wanted the biggest bonus who doesn't, that they could get. And so there was this whole thing about meets expectations versus exceeds expectations. And what we asked people to do in the goal setting process was to define what meets is and what exceeds was, and then go for exceeds. You know, like it's sometimes people, I think, set their goals to be sure they can make them. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, so that they can, so that there are a meets expect, and then they set their goals and they meet them and they real, and, and the business says, but that really wasn't sufficient. Uh, That wasn't really impactful. Um, You completed it, but what did it really create for the business? Um, And so that's an, an idea because if it's your game, you know, if you're really driving your performance, then you can say, what is my promise to the business at a minimum? And that's a meets expectations goal. And what's my prom- What's my promise to myself in the possibility of what I could create? And you go for that. And it's very rare that the business will look at um, those exceptional results and say, well, or even if you had your goal being an exceptional result, you're more likely to have the business say, that's exceptional. Yeah. And that's where managers need to be actively involved in that process because um, right. they need to make sure that stretch is truly stretch. Because if I right. come to you, Mary, as my manager, and I say exceeds is 110% of last year, you should be able to look at me and say, Mark, given the market, given what you're capable of, and given what we're expecting, it's more like 125% of last year. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, it's very easy for that fairness piece to go away. If I set what I think is a stretch goal and you think is an average goal, but we never have that conversation. Yeah. Well, and if you think about performance management for yourself, well, it's just, it's like not the business or the organization's purpose, but performance management, the purpose for performance management for me is to use the system to, um, to drive my highest possible performance. Because if you did that, you would set the goal for something that was your highest possible performance. You would work really hard to understand what's the potential impact I could have on the business. And then you would go out and get feedback, (laughs) not feedback like performance management feedback, but you would go back and say, how am I doing? And could I have done something different? And you know, um, uh, you know, where can I develop? Um, uh, and it, and it takes it, wouldn't it take it out of this sort of like 
you know, I'm going to go have a performance review, whether it's quarterly or mid-year. Uh, those should be like on the right com- the right topic. Right. And this process has such a bad name and, you know, it feels so evaluative and people dread it. Mm-hmm. If we can reframe it, I think, as you're suggesting, you know, this is a process, this is a tool to make you better, to help you be at your best and to help the company also improve. And if it's not doing that for you, then, then that's, that's a problem. And what can you do to fix it? And what I don't care what the system is. I, I stand that any person in the organization can improve their performance by participating fully in the performance management system. Yes. Right? Absolutely. So, right? So what would you what would you say someone can do to to participate fully in this assessment process? So end of year or middle of the year, or if you thought about it as an assessment process, that's continuous. I would suggest it starts with um, asking more frequently for feedback. Uh, Why don't most of us ask for feedback? Because we don't want to hear it. Um, And so part of it is humbling ourselves to say, there's probably at least one thing I could do better right now. Uh, I'm going to ask, you know, people I trust, hopefully my boss is included in that, uh, for their advice about, you know, how I can be a bit better going along. That's not an everyday question, but maybe it's a once a month question. Uh, you know, is there something I can do or what one thing can I do, uh, to be better this year? Um, but also recognize that, um, you should have set really big challenging goals and you should be open to hearing, uh, whether you met them, exceeded them or didn't make them and be hungry to do better the next year. Um, assessment is never fun. None of us like being told anything other than you're great, but recognize most years, uh, none of us is going to be in the top 10%. Uh, and that should be okay. As long as you're striving for it. And if you're told you're in the top 10% every year, uh, I'm questioning if you're getting honest feedback. Yeah. And, and I would just building off your point about asking for feedback. I think part of why that's painful or we get something vague or we not helpful is we're not specific enough. So if you can really frame up that ask, you know, what specifically are you looking for feedback on and ask broadly, ask often, you'll likely get something useful. Um, And I think in the evaluation process, it's important as much as we've been harping on results, the behaviors that got you to the results are just as important. So if you knocked it out of the park and exceeded your your sales quota, but there's bodies all around you because you treat people badly or whatever, then it's not necessarily a good thing and you shouldn't necessarily be rewarded. So both of those components, I think, are important in that process. And I think if you know how you're doing over the year, there should be, you know, if if you're if you want to win the game and I do think of it as a little bit of a game because it's not so certain it's not like you go in door one and you know get the prize um the the you can you can shape the assessment of your performance by validating how it's being viewed periodically if you think about it, like I want to get feedback and I want to develop. And I also want to test whether where I am against the goal. So you said, Mark, at the beginning that, you know, managers should be sitting down, um, you know, maybe at least a quarter saying like against your three goals, here's what, but how about the person can go to the manager and say, here are my three goals. And here's my assessment of how I'm doing against my three goals is that consistent with the way you view it? Because if it's not, I want to know. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah you're nodding your heads. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, so absolutely. So what holds people back? And and why, why is it seen as an organization's system? 
I would suggest it's because the organization um, puts that system out there. So if if I didn't want someone to manage my performance and now the company is saying, here's a process, well, then it's your process. It's certainly not mine because I had no desire. I just wanted a, a paycheck. Um, so I think it's natural they think of it as the organization's process. I think a good self-motivated individual says it might be your process, but I'm going to use it to help me be even better. So just because I didn't name the game doesn't mean that I can't try to win the game the way it's played. That goes back to our conversation around rules need to be clear. It needs to be a fair process because it's difficult to win the game if I don't know the rules uh, and it's not fair, but uh, recognize most people are happy just to go along. Um, It's those few who are willing to raise their hand and say, to your point, it is a game. How do I win this game? Uh, those are the ones who are going to to outshine and, and get the rewards that they deserve. And they can go talk to their HR business partner or their manager or who who do they find out who what the game is? Oh, what the structure? I don't mean what the game is, but what's the structure of performance management at the company? I think either of those two, I mean, your manager should definitely be able to tell you as well as um, your HR Mm -hmm. resources. Mm -hmm. And then sort of lastly, um, it's a leading question. (laughs) Um, um, What's the value of thinking long-term relative to performance management as an employee versus annual cycles. Like it's, it's a long people's performance and career is a long game. It doesn't naturally fit into one year segments. How can people think about that in organizations? Well, it is a challenge, especially if you're trying to set goals that have a long-term impact, but you're going to be evaluated at the end of the year. Right. And sometimes there's ways you can carve that up and there's milestones that will be recognized at in the short term. Right. And you can still be making a longer term contribution. Um but it, and I think that it's also contextual with other things going on. You know, when mm-hmm. I had three small kids at home, and you know, I I was okay with just meeting expectations because I knew yes. I was being stretched in many other aspects of my life. And so I think sometimes it's just being um, giving ourselves a break and and being reasonable with with what we can accomplish with the circumstances we're dealt. I think that's a very powerful statement um, and something for people to think about is what 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 is how does this segment of my life? Maybe it's not one year, maybe it's five years, maybe it's 12 years. How am I going to think about my contribution during this segment? Mm -hmm. Um, And and um, and and again, that's about playing your own game. Right. Right. Absolutely. managing your own expectations. And that's not about having low expectations, but it's not trying to shoot the moon um, um, every time. Right. And it also could be because you're new in your job and learning. And so it's natural that the contribution yes. you make in the first year is not going to be the same as when you're there for five years. So. Or in this particular year, we used to always say this uh, in, in the Simpson and company, for this particular form, performance cycle, my projects didn't give me an opportunity to exceed. There was no opportunity. I did the work. I did really good work. And that was meets expectations. And there was no opportunity to shine. And that was just fine because all the work was hard. <laughs> and maybe that means that your colleague got to shine that year. Exactly. Good too. Exactly. Which goes to, let's not penalize people who show up, do a good job, behave properly Correct. and and give us what we ask them for. That's a great year. We should make sure those people feel incredibly valued um, yes. and not as somehow stuck in some middle category. And people should create, create the experience of value for themselves. So again, you know, if that's, my reality for that year, you can really be proud of what you've done 
um, 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 that has met the expectations of the organization. Well, we've covered a lot of ground today, and I hope we've given people some good conceptual framework for performance management. And I love all of the tips that um, and ways of operating that you've shared with people. So I just want to thank you both for taking your time today to be on the show. And I am excited to, to share this with my audience. Thank you, Mary. Enjoy the Great. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Today's show was produced by Eric Aubrey. Our theme music was written and produced by Eric Aubrey and Tim McKinstry. The show's graphics were designed by Devin Marciano. Remember to subscribe to our podcast on Google, Apple, or Spotify. You can also find episodes at MavisCompany.com, where I invite you to sign up for my weekly newsletter. I hope you use some nugget to help you create remarkable results in your world. Thank you for listening.